In this lecture, we will introduce instrumental variables as an important tool of causal inference. In the first video, we will cover the basics of instrumental variables. So the roadmap of this entire lecture is we want to learn about what are instrumental variables and how can they help us to identify causal effects. And we will then also talk about how they can be used um, and, and how we can interpret the estimates that, that we obtain when using instrumental variables and in what way they differ from OLS or matching estimates. As we will see, instrumental variables are very useful because they can overcome a severe endogeneity problem, but they also estimate a different parameter relative to an OLS regression. And therefore, we, and we need to obviously know what that parameter is in order to understand what we are actually doing. So that's the roadmap for the talk. If you want to go deeper into the material, I recommend the uh, chapters in Angrist and Pischke and also in the causal inference mixtape, which is probably the first start, should be the starting point when, when reading about this technique. So the starting point for instrumental variables, before we go into any causal notation, instrumental variables of all the techniques of, of causal inference have probably been around the longest. And they actually come from the idea that you want to, or from the desire to quantify what happens in markets, right? So if you think about a, very simple, uh, simple market where you have a supply and a demand curve, um, then obviously that's a theoretical model. Okay? And, and it's a theoretical model that every uh, student in economics learns. And obviously, but, but testing this model is actually not that not that simple empirically. Why? Well, because what you, you have is, let's say you observe in different, on different trading days, you observe different prices and different quantities traded. But what that does not easily allow you to do is to, to actually trace out what the supply and the demand curve is. And so, so you could simply have a situation like this, where you have a shift in both the demand and the supply curve, and you have basically no change in prices, but you have a change in quantity or the other way around. And so you, you don't quite, uh, you, you would in, in such a model not know based on the on the the, the the data that you observe in terms of prices and quantities whether you identify a supply curve or a demand curve or something that lies in between mm -hmm. um, yet that's actually what we typically want to know i give you an example um, in very basic labor economics one of the questions is does an increase in the number of workers, for example, through, uh, through immigration, reduce wages. So that's equivalent to a shift of the supply curve to the right. And then we move down the demand curve in the simplest possible model. Okay? But if we only observe the number of workers and wages or work hours and wages, uh, that will not be sufficient to actually um, to to actually characterize that that labor demand curve. So, what has already emerged in the in the nineteen twenties, and what you can read up on in uh, in the mixtape, is that economists have developed instrumental variables in order to overcome this problem. Yeah? 
Um, so again, the, the problem is here, what we observe in terms of prices and quantities is our equilibrium relationships, but we would actually want to know the, the supply and demand behavior separately. Right? And we only observe them in equilibrium and we don't observe a counterfactual of what the demand would be if the price was different and what the supply would be if the price was different. That's what we actually want to know. And so how do you do that? Well, we would need something that shifts, for example, the supply curve left and right without affecting demand. Right? So if you have a variable that shifts supply, then that would allow you to trace out the demand curve, right? Because if, if, if you have a supply curve here and a supply, supply curve there, um, and, and so from those three supply curves, you can trace out the demand curve, or you can at least estimate it, right? So, so you basically observe those three points and you can, can estimate what the slope of the demand curve is. And so um, likewise, you could think about a demand shifter, which allows you then to trace out the supply curve. Um, so for example, something like this. Now from those three blue dots, um, you would be able to trace out the supply curve. So what are examples of this? Um, there is this famous paper by uh, Josh Angrist and, and Catherine Grady, which we teach to our undergrads um, about the, the, the fish market, where they use the availability of fish in the ocean um, and, and weather conditions, which obviously determine supply um, as supply shifters. And so the idea is that if there is bad weather, there is very little fish that comes uh, on land um, because there is fewer fishing boats out or it's harder for them to fish, yet the demand remains the same. And so the weather conditions uh, determine the, the supply, but not the demand or demand shifters. An example is uh, when you think about the demand for ice cream, which is what we teach our undergrads. Um, obviously, the, the weather um, is, is, a, is a demand shifter. It does not affect, at least in the short run, the supply of ice cream from day to day, but it affects how many people want ice cream. And that would then allow us to, to is a demand shifter and that would allow us to trace out the supply curve for, for ice cream. So this is where, where IVs initially came from. So they, they come from what one can call structural econometrics. You want to estimate economic relationships that come directly from theory. However, Researchers in recent years, and not only in recent years, in the last 30 years at least, have also used instrumental variables for causal inference that may not relate to, to economic models like the simple one that I, that I showed here. So the way they, they rather think about it is that you have a treatment, DI, and an outcome. Okay, so you have the I is a, a policy or a policy change and Y is, is an outcome that you want to study. And so again, think about the, the examples I've been giving, I've been giving before, um, whether you go to the gym or not, that is maybe the treatment and then your health outcomes are your outcomes. Um, whether a firm exports or not is the treatment and uh, then the outcome is how productive that firm is. Now, we've talked previously about uh, the, the empirical challenges here. In order for beta to have a causal interpretation, I need to make an identification assumption and that identification assumption is also called zero conditional mean assumption or conditional independence assumption, CIA, um, which is that there is no correlation between uh, the treatment and any other determinants of the outcome. And given that any economic action 
whether it's by people, by governments, by firms, is, is the result of a deliberate choice, or at least choice that has some deliberate element to it, and it's not just a random process, we, that assumption almost never holds. And because it's obviously firms that export are different from, from others, um, workers who become unemployed uh, are different from workers who don't, um, and, and so on and so forth. Um, customers who purchase a certain, a, an expensive car are different from those who don't. And so we can hardly ever then is, ascribe differences in the average outcomes to whether someone has done, made a certain choice or not, because those choices are the result of, of a process into which many determinants feed. And so that's, that's obviously a huge problem that is often called unobserved heterogeneity. So again, simply put, people who attend and who don't attend a gym are different in many ways, and our model doesn't capture those differences. And so beta, if we run that simple regression, beta would pick up part of those differences of why, you know, why some people go to the gym and, 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 and others not. And so we cannot say that that these people are healthier because they go to the gym, but that's exactly what we are interested in. Um, there is other issues, which is that uh, that the treatment may be measured with error. So us as the researchers, we as the researchers may not completely observe uh, who is treated and to what degree. Um, this is very often the case because we typically get data from a secondary you know, data provider from the government, from the statistical office. And th there is usually as, as much as these, these data become cleaner over time, there's, there's oftentimes a measurement error involved here that, that can be a problem. And that also leads, uh, even, even if there is no correlation between the error term and, uh, and the treatment, so there's no unobserved heterogeneity. Still, if you have measurement error in the treatment, this conditional independence assumption doesn't hold. And so that's the starting point for IME, which is we have, or the starting point for any causal inference problem, um, we have reason to believe that the conditional independence assumption doesn't hold. We have an energy problem and we cannot readily identify uh, or causally identify that parameter beta that we're interested in. So what can we do? And here is, here is where IV is, is coming in. So IV allows you to, to break this correlation between the treatment and the error term, this unobserved heterogeneity, and allows you to, to obtain a consistent causal estimate of the, the treatment on the outcome. So what's the idea behind it? The idea is that, first of all, we're in this world that I, that I already mentioned on the previous slide. So you have a confounder, basically. So we have you here as a confounder. We know that it's most likely an issue. So we know that it most likely simultaneously affects the treatment and the outcome, yet uh, we don't observe it and so we can't adjust for it. And in the real world, that's almost always an, an issue because you can never adjust for all the potential confounders that might be there. So here, the idea of an instrumental variable is that we have a variable Z that affects the outcome, right? the outcome Y, but only through its effect on, on the treatment. Right? So what could that be? How should we think about Z? Um, Z is something like an incentive to, to be treated. So imagine someone gives people randomly a voucher that allows them to attend a gym for a year for free. Um, and then uh, obviously those people who get the voucher have a greater incentive to go to the gym. And so some of them may then actually choose to go. That, that's an, that would be one idea for how an instrumental variable could work. Right? So, so, so obviously 
if those vouchers are effective in the sense that they actually get some people to, to go to the gym. And if, if going to the gym makes people healthier, then those vouchers should ultimately affect the outcome, but they should affect the outcome only through people going to the gym and no other channel. Right? And very importantly here, you see in this tag, you see no arrow between the instrument and the confounder. And that, that's the crucial uh, element of instrumental variables as an identification strategy, this missing arrow, which is called the exclusion restriction. So, so how should we think about an IV? I already mentioned one interpretation. Uh, I mentioned the one down here. Um, the instrument Z can be seen as a, a, a the, either a treatment that is offered or the incentive to be treated that is offered to, to units or people. Okay? Um, so, you know, think about a vouchers, think about a certain policy that only affects some groups and not others. Um, but then, you know, for example, uh, in, in uh, a lot of unemployment uh, programs or, or job training programs, it's not that people are forced um, and the police show up in, in, in front of people's houses and force them to take part in a job training program. But typically people are getting a letter, get invited to participate in a job training program. That could be potentially an instrument because it's not that, that, that people are treated with that job training program, but they receive an invitation and then some of them, uh, some of them actually then participate and others don't. And obviously to make the, the instrument then uh, valid, it has to be as good as randomly assigned. Why? Well, because we have this exclusion restriction, that it sh uh, which is the stop sign here, which is that it should not, be, should not affect the outcome through any other channel than, uh, than the actual treatment. Okay? So if it is that, for example, healthier people people who are healthier to begin with get those vouchers to go to a, to a gym or are more likely to get them, then that would certainly not be a, a valid instrument. Right? Because one component of you here is that we don't observe people's basic health. And obviously, if, if our procedure but of distributing those vouchers uh, makes us give a lot more to people who are healthy to begin with, then obviously that would not help us in, in identifying the effect of going to the gym on, on health outcomes. Right? So the instrument should be as good as randomly assigned. That, that's, that's one very important, uh, one important ingredient um, of, of instrumental variables and, and one of the, the, the two important identification assumptions. Another way to think about an IV and one that we will revisit when we talk about marginal treatment effects comes more from, a, uh, from microeconomics and comes more from the idea of people or firms or governments making choices through constrained optimization. Yeah. So what we observe is people's behavior given their preferences, given their utility functions, given their constraints. And what the instrument is, is, is a shock that changes the behavior of at least some of the people in firms. Okay, so if you think about um, people choose certain things, by max they maximize the utility subject to a constraint, for example, a budget constraint, then the instrument could be a shifter to that bad budget constraint. Right? So, so all of a sudden, peop some people get more money or less um, and other people don't. And as long as that shock is randomly assigned across people, that can be used then as an instrument. And I will show you examples um, as, as we go along in, in the live, in the videos, as well as then in, in, in 
live lectures that come with it. Okay, here is another uh, interpretation. Um, so when you compare IV estimation to a plain OLS estimation, so you would simply, so you're interested in this arrow here, so you would just run an OLS regression of Y on D. Okay, so you know, let Y be education, let, uh, sorry, let Y be wages, let D be education, you run an, uh, a regression, you have microdata with education and wages, you run a regression of log wages on education as generation after generation of labor economists have done. Um, now that, that regression uses the entire variation in education. And so education here is the treatment. Whereas IV only uses the variation in the treatment that is explained by the instrument or that is related to the instrument. So going away from education, because that, that's a bit trickier to instrument, but going back to the example of vouchers, what, so suppose I go back to the example of going to the gym, does that make you healthier? Right? So if I run a regression of people's health status on whether they attend a gym or not, that for the entire sample uses the variation in person goes to the gym regularly or not. Whereas if I use vouchers as an instrumental variable, so, so some people randomly receive a voucher and others don't, and then those who receive a voucher can choose to go to the gym or, or not, then obviously that creates additional variation because among those people who were offered the voucher, some, only some people go and others not. So it only uses the variation in, in whether people go to the gym or not that is explained by whether they have received the voucher or not. And as we will see in multiple examples, instrumental variables uses less variation in, in the treatment, but it uses variation that is unrelated to any confounding factors, if it's valid and if all the identification assumptions hold. So we have two ingredients for instrumental variables that are critical. The one is the so-called first stage, which is the green arrow. So the so obviously, if we want to use a variable that has an effect on the outcome only through the treatment, then it should be correlated with the treatment, right? So if you distribute those vouchers and then no one takes it up, then there is obviously no correlation between the treatment and the instrument. And it, by definition, it cannot have an effect on the outcome unless there's something wrong, you know, that people uh, feel miserable because they got those vouchers or so. Right? But, but if, if, the, if the correct model is, is the one you see here, then that shouldn't happen. Okay, so, so that's the first stage. And then we have the exclusion restriction, which is the red arrow here, which should not be there. As in, there should be no correlation between the instrument and any confounder. And as we will learn, this instrument, the exclusion restriction is, is one component of instrument validity. And the validity of an instrument actually has two components. The one is the instrument is as good as randomly assigned. And the second one is that it has no direct effect on the outcome, which is the exclusion restriction. So it, it should not, it must not have um, an effect on the outcome through any other channel, right? So if, if it has a direct effect as I've drawn here, then that would be an, an invalid instrument. So the exclusion restriction um, explicitly states that. And we will learn more formally how this, this works in, a, in another video. Now you need to be aware of two things here. 
So as I mentioned, these are the two crucial ingredients of, of an IV estimation, the first stage relationship and the exclusion restriction. The first stage relationship is obviously testable. If you observe the instrument and if you observe the treatment, you can run a regression of the treatment on the instrument and you can see if there is a correlation. Um, and so that's testable. How strong the correlation has to be, we will come to later. It, let me just tell you, it has to be obviously very, very strong. Because remember, the instrument only uses a subset of the, the variation in the treatment. And, and so if, if, that, if the correlation is weak, the amount of variation in the treatment that the instrumental variable estimator actually uses is very, very small. And then your estimates become very unreliable. But it's testable. The second assumption, the exclusion restriction of the instrument is not testable. So that's the identification assumption. It's the assumption that this arrow from between Z, between the instrument and Y um, of either a direct effect or an effect through a confounder is missing. That, that's the assumption here. And the challenge here is that this cannot be tested, this assumption. And so if you attend any seminar or conference and someone presents an instrumental variable paper, typically it's, if the presentation is an hour, it's five minutes about the idea of the paper, five minutes about uh, how the, the instrument should work, and then about 50 minutes a discussion of why people think that uh, the, the author, uh, the exclusion restriction that the author has chosen does not hold. And so what this means is that if you use instrumental variables, you will need to make a very convincing argument that the exclusion restriction holds. And that depends on the context um, in which you use an instrumental variable but it has become a lot harder over time to make convincing arguments in favor of instrumental variables. This is why some people say, friends tell their friends not to use IV. That's probably a bit harsh um, and I wouldn't go that far because you can look at top journals, you still see IV papers, but you see fewer than you would have seen 15 years ago. And the reason, there's two reasons for that. Some of the, low-hanging fruit in terms of IV, at least that's what we can say in hindsight, has been harvested and it's, it's just getting harder to find research questions now that are interesting and can be answered with IVs. Um, and, and the other is simply that we know now a lot more than, than we used to about uh, why the exclusion restriction in certain um, in certain instances may not hold, right? So uh, one common instrument is the amount of rainfall. And uh, there has been lots of papers recently showing that rainfall is, is not a, a very, is, is oftentimes not a valid instrument, right? Um, or another classic instrument that has been used in labor economics for a person's relative age is, is their quarter of birth. So whether they're born in, in, uh, in spring, which means that they're very young within their school cohort or born in autumn, which means that they will be relatively old. But it turns out that the, the people, you know, people with different socioeconomic status conceive at different seasons. Why that is the case, I have no idea, but, but there is a very clear correlation. Not strong, but it's there, and that obviously invalidates the exclusion restriction. Right? So, so you, you have to be very, very careful and have to make a very convincing argument in favor of your exclusion restriction. That will come up over and over again. Now, let's look at the IV estimator a little bit more formally. Um, and we have here four equations that we deal with. So the first thing is that we have the relationship of interest. So we want to look at the effect of uh, a treatment D on an outcome Y and may, may adjust for some pretreatment 
differences, which is x. Now, then we have the first stage, which is we regress the, the treatment on the instrument, again, control for, for x, for the same controls as we would have done in, in the, when we just run a, an OLS regression. Um, and so what IV does is basically, it estimates this first stage regression first, from that estimation, it obtains estimates for those two parameters and obviously also for, um, for, for this one here. And then it projects, it makes a projection of, of the treatment, okay? So, so basically the way it works is you, you run that, that regression um, you get uh, delta naught hat and delta one hat, and then you just feed in x and z into that that uh, equation, and you predict the treatment based on z and 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 x. Okay, what does that give you then? What what is that that uh, d hat? It's the treatment that is predicted by the instrument. Yeah? Um, so. For example, so take again the voucher example. So D is the treatment is whether someone regularly goes to the gym or not. Z is whether the person got a voucher or not. And now if, if every person who gets a voucher also then regularly goes to the gym, um, then obviously delta one hat would be one. If the, the relationship is imperfect because, you know, maybe some people who receive a voucher just throw it away or decide, you know, that's not for me, or they would have gone anyway, then that, uh, regardless of whether they get the voucher or not, then obviously delta one is, is smaller than, 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 than one. Okay. Um, and so what the, what the hat, the predicted treatment gives you then is the, the, gym use for every person, the predicted use of the gym that is purely based on the vouchers. And if those vouchers are, are um, randomly assigned, then, then that, uh, the, the, the distribution of those vouchers is obviously unrelated to any unobserved determinants of the outcome. And so that would solve the endogeneity problem. So that's the first stage. And then what, what we, what the estimator does, it's, it's an inbuilt routine in, in any, um, in any statistical package is it would take those predictions and plug them into this, into the, the equation you see up here into the relationship of interest. So instead of running a regression of, uh, as you would do here, the outcome on the treatment, you would run a regression of the outcome on the predicted treatment. Mm -hmm. And so, so because the predicted treatment does not suffer from the endogeneity problem that the actual treatment would suffer, we can identify uh, the causal effect of, in this case, going to the gym or generally the treatment on the outcome. Okay? That, that's the idea, okay? So, so, so the estimate for beta tilde is free from this, this uh, omitted variable bias, uh, which stems from the fact that we don't observe, um, you know, the determinants of who goes to the gym or who doesn't. Now, there's a fourth equation that you will see very often, and that, that is also quite important in deriving the IV estimator, which is the reduced form, which is what you see here. So the reduced form is simply the regression of the outcome on the instrument. Okay. Uh, so you could think about the reduced form as the, as the following. You take your relationship of interest and you simply substitute the, the, the first stage into the relationship of, of interest. That would give you then the reduced form. Okay. So in, in the dark, you have the instrument which affects the treatment, which affects the outcome. And so obviously the, 
relationship between the outcome and the instrument is called the reduced form. And we will see why the reduced form is actually quite important in the next video.